Okay, now we're being live streamed, so now we should probably clean it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah, Flame is amazing. Uh, hold on, I'm going to actually stop the recording, and then we'll start the recording again, because I even did it like the real legit way. Like I looked down over my glasses, you know, like someone my age would. Okay. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Wayne. Hello, Burned. Hey, guys. Welcome to the big show. Hey, everybody. Uh, I think hey. I will. You know, um, we are. Uh, there is a chance that Brian Bailey is going to join the meeting, and he's in Seoul, South Korea right now, uh, doing some uh, live flame demos. And so uh, he, he wanted to try to join today and, and give us an update and let us know how it's going. He, like a good traveler uh, in, in the year of our Lord, 2022, he's been posting pictures of everything he's eating. You know, so I like from a culinary standpoint, I have been able to follow him uh, on his journey, which has been uh, kind of awesome. But uh, we did want to hear maybe like a, a flamically, uh, you know, what he's been doing over there as well as, uh, you know, cuisinically or whatever. I mean, Randy you used to work in the kitchen, so you probably know the word. The cuisinically is, uh, you know, that's that's how the, uh, the East Coasters say it. Right, right, right. Thank you. See, it's way to always make it about the culture. Okay, John Ag is here. Why don't we do our best, and by we I mean me, to make this uh, feel like a like an actual uh, episode of Logic Live? So I'm gonna do. Do we have to? I have not. <laughs> I have not. Clearly, we do. I have not done one of these on Zoom in so long that every button I press feels like a potential failure. <laughs> so we're going to try this. Okay, and if it doesn't work, I'm sure Randy will let me know. Well, that's how I feel. Uh, and even if it does work, so. I'm sure he's going to let me know. He'll say something like, Andy, you're muted. <laughs> so here we go. There we go. Is that too loud? Andy, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, see? It's funny how that works. All right. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Okay. You know, I'll turn the music down a little bit. And, uh, I'll take you through the slideshow. Let me just see if anyone else has joined. In terms of, if you've joined, just say hi. Oh, Jake Parker's here. Hey, Jake. Hello. The sun is not... Oh, hold on. Wait a minute. Breaking news. We have Brian Bailey here. Hey, Brian. I'm going to stop this Hello, here. hello. All right, you know what? Let me just power through. I'll try to get through this while the music's going. Uh, Randy, we have a minute and 50 seconds. So this episode of uh, Logic Live is brought to you by AJA. AJA, together with Flames since 2006. If you need tech support, call Jack Horrocks. It's amazing how well this all plays in a browser. If you want to be the second person in Logic history to use the 15% discount code, uh, make sure you use Logic-15 at checkout if you need anything from Boris FX. While you're checking things out, check out the Logic merch store. I don't know about where you guys are. I mean, with the except they see John, even though it's, um, you're so close to the South Pole that you've entered like into like that six months of night, um, you still look bright and cheery in your Logic uh, attire. It looks like you've got the hoodie on. God bless you and thank you for your support. I know it only took four months to get to you via the post. Um, we want to thank all of our patrons on Patreon. We could not do what we do without you. The list keeps growing. We're at 136 patrons. If you'd like to support what we're doing here at Logic for as little as five bucks a month and get access to some exclusive merch and, uh, and some content, please head over to patreon.com slash logic TV and become a patron today. Speaking of patrons and patron benefits, we want to give a shout out to our friend, uh, Brooks Tomlinson, uh, Lenovo reached out to Randy McAtee. I don't know if you saw that video he made with them, that in partnership with them, where he looked absolutely awesome in his absolutely awesome home studio. Uh, but Lenovo reached out to Randy and said, we love what you're doing with Logic. We'd like to support the community. What can we do? And they gave us uh, a fully loaded P620, and we wanted to give back to our patrons. And so that went to the lovely and talented Brooks Tomlinson. Congratulations, Brooks. And thank you, Lenovo for supporting Logic. Speaking of Brooks, the Detroit Flame user group is having its inaugural meeting 
uh, for summer 2022 on Thursday, August 18th at 6.30 p.m. at Flavor in Detroit. If you can make it, please try to be there. Look at this lineup, ladies and gentlemen, of presenters. Fred Warren, who uh, we just had on last week, the uh, uh, Flame User Experience Designer at Autodesk, will be there. And then there'll also be presentations from Steve Swike, the aforementioned Brooks Tomlinson. Uh, Finn Yeager is going to be there, coming all the way from Hamburg. And Javi Mendez from Cinesis. And don't worry, pizza, I believe that's Detroit-style Detroit pizza by, uh, by decree and law. Uh, pizza and beer will be provided by our friends at Cinesis. Thank you, Cinesis, for always supporting the Flame community. That's August 18th. Head on over to the forum for the, the event bright link. I'll also put it in the, uh, in the description of the, uh, uh, the YouTube posting here. We'd love to see as many people show up and support the Detroit user group as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, returning July 17th, we're going back to the Render Dome for the ultimate conform challenge. Bernd Hildebrand from Germany and Brian Bailey from Dallas, Texas are going to be competing head to head at the uh, Boris FX Arena, which is actually Brian Fox's garage, uh, on July 17th. That's two weeks from today. We're still putting the details together for the show, but I guarantee you it's going to be amazing. In fact, we have Bernd and Brian here, and uh, I would love to see if we can get some, uh, some, some shit talking going and, uh, you know, all the kind of stuff you have, like, at the press conference before, like, a big fight or stare something down, like that. Stare down, Andy. It's a called stare down? a stare down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, clearly, it's, it's, a, it's a genre of sporting that I'm a huge fan of, and that's why uh, I, I knew the terminology. So, Bernd versus Brian, uh, back in the Render Dome. July 17th, uh, and they're competing for uh, a Cintiq, a Wacom Cintiq 16-inch tablet. I have it sitting right over here, and uh, we want to thank our friends at, at, at Wacom, actually, for uh, sponsoring that. Let's uh, do the thing that's the only reason Randy tunes in on Sundays is the update for the forum stats for 2022. We're up to 1,149 users. That's up five over last week, 901,000 page views. That's up 30,000 from last week. 7.7 thousand posts. It's up 200 from last week. And we're up to 389 users on Discord. If you haven't signed up for Discord, please do. It's a great, a great way to have a, a, or as we like to say, join the conversation. We have live chat and screen sharing and everything going on 24 hours a day on our Discord service, uh, server. And you can get the link to that at forum.logic.tv. want to remind everyone that we introduced three new classes at Logic Academy for 2022. The first one was Beauty Techniques in Flame by yours truly where I covered all kinds of beauty cleanup techniques and did it all kind of under the umbrella of how to work as efficiently as possible. And then the lovely and talented Randy McEntee uh, gave us two installments, one on the machine learning time warp and the other uh, setting up Pybox, which is a way to integrate Flame into your pipeline with, with other applications, in this case, Nuke. And uh, these join the other Logic Academy offerings, Connect and Conform and the Image Node, Intro to NDI and 8-Minute Aces. We have new ones in production right now that we'll get out to you later this summer. And they're available for free at Logic.tv or YouTube.com slash Logic.tv. We want to thank our friends at Autodesk for sponsoring Logic Academy. Speaking of content from Autodesk, the latest from the Flame Learning Channel, our friend Grant Kay has been doing a whole fundamental series for people who are new to Flame. Uh, the latest installment, Module 8, uh, is all about doing effects uh, in the timeline. So be sure to check that out at uh, the Flame Learning Channel on YouTube. And speaking of Flame, if you haven't already downloaded it, please download Flame 2023.0.1. So you're running the latest and greatest from our friends at Autodesk. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, it's July 3rd here in the States. I believe it's July 15th where John is. Um, actually, I should say we're John, Brian, and we actually have almost as much representation from tomorrow as we do today here on Logic Live, which is really um, kind of a, a messing with my mind as I, as, as I think about it. But Brian Bailey is in Seoul, South Korea, right? You are there to uh, do some presentations for, uh, for Autodesk on Flame. What's going on there, man? How's it going? Uh, good. It's uh, 3 a.m. on July 4th, so that's fun. My, I've had, I have had completely just bonkers, weird hours the whole time I've been here. So this is starting to get normal for me. Oh, <laughs> just in time to come home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So they, they have a uh, convention here called COBA, 
C uh, K O B A, which is similar to N A B, mm-hmm. and uh, the reseller here asked me to come do some master classes for flame users in Korea. So uh, it was pretty interesting. The uh, I knew nothing about the flame community here before coming, and it's interesting to see how they use flame here. Um, it's basically all commercial work. Um, nobody told me that they really do color. They get like colored Rec 709 files. They work, you know, to HD deliverables for TV and, and that's about it. So I tried uh, talking about, you know, social media, different sizes and resolutions, stuff like that. Some of them were interested in that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of, The flame artists do beauty work and I shared some uh, like tips and tricks for beauty, but they all knew them already. They were like, yeah, that's old stuff. We know that. (laughs) Um, uh, Trying to think of what else the uh, it's, it was interesting. We had eight different sessions and at the end of it, we had about 90 uh, flame artists come through. Wow. And what was especially interesting was the gender split is basically 50 50, which is really interesting. I don't know. I don't know what that says about, you know, us Americans. We seem to be dude heavy, but uh, there's, you know, plenty of very talented, very smart uh, female flame artists here. So that was cool to see. That's amazing. Um, so are, are you like is, is are you um at like a convention center is it a, like a kind of a traditional trade show setting yeah and actually there's this huge complex called coex and there's a hotel which is where i'm at and i just walked down through the lobby over to the convention center uh and there's also a mall like it's the biggest kind of like city center i think in seoul so that was nice. I didn't have to go outside in the rain uh, to get to the convention. Mm-hmm. It rains. It rains most days here. It's it is. Uh, I don't know, like ninety to a hundred degrees and raining, which is new for me. Uh-huh. I'm from Texas, where we have heat, yeah. but not you know a hundred percent humidity. <laughs> so I just I became one with my sweat basically sure <laughs> randy would uh, you like to uh, take that and knock it out of the park or <laughs> i mean i would but that's just how i feel so you know it's the same kind of thing uh the one other thing that was interesting was i i asked you know is who here knows about python do you use python scripting and i got completely blank stares like they have no idea mm-hmm. what python is and well, I mean, I, they know it's, you know, a coding language, but they don't know what it is in Flame. So I just showed some of my simple, you know, I am I know enough Python just to automate real simple things and showed a few of those and they, their minds were blown by like, you know, wow, I didn't even know we could do this kind of stuff. So I'm going to try to follow up and get them more interested in, you know, integrating Python into the work they do. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So you said that by and large, it's been uh, a commercial crowd. Yes, it's like absolutely commercial. Nobody does anything else, um, which is interesting. I'm, I have, I wasn't able to get a lot of details on, you know, who does movie and film work and who does commercial work. But everyone that came here for Flame was post house doing commercial work, and it kind of it sounds like the film industry is. Uh, very segregated and it's all done with nuke Mm -hmm. so interesting stuff and how much longer are you there when do you come home uh i'm gonna head to the airport in about (laughs) yeah (laughs) no i'm flying out today and uh it's interesting i leave at like 5 p.m it's a 14 hour flight and i arrive home the same day and time that i left so that's, I think, going to be <laughs> yeah. 
worse than coming here as far as uh, jet lag. Yeah, you're going to feel like you're 67 when you land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Richard is nodding. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you've made this, this, this trek across the dateline to the States. Yeah, good luck with that mine. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least you got up super early uh, on your travel day, you know, so we want to thank you for that, man. I do oh, I'm going back to here. bed after this. So, All right. <laughs> uh, then maybe we'll just have a quick chat with with, uh, with Burned as well, you know, about uh, Render Dome, and then we'll let you go <laughs> in case you want to dip cool. out early. Which yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk trash at all. I'm, I'm excited to uh, see what another flame artist you know, how they approach something I do too. Mm -hmm. All right. Wow. Cool. What a, what a, what a mature perspective. We're so not used to that in a render. Dome. <laughs> yes. I, I, do I need to adopt some, uh, Andy deal attitude? No, uh, no, nah. <laughs> no. Nah. It's probably better that we take a turn, you know, and just, maybe we'll just leave the smack talking to the, to the, uh, the commentators or something like that, you know, and we'll okay. keep all the, everything on the field will be respectable, you know, <laughs> for the first nine minutes. For the first nine minutes. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask Amanda: Are you excited for another render dome? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get my material prepared. Excellent. Um, Burned. I don't know if you if you can hear us or if uh, you can turn your camera on. Hi there. I can hear you. I can see you. I hope you can hear me. I oh, yeah. just don't have a webcam here. Sorry. Oh, then don't turn your camera on. Stay, stay <laughs> mysterious, Burned, because right now yes. you're uh, just say you're lifting weights and doing uh, practicing your additive gear and uh, and timeline action effects in preparation. Right. You've added like uh, five um, kilo weights to either side of your pen, and you're just kind of <laughs> going like this, right? So that you can be that much faster uh, on the day of the competition. But no worries, there will be a webcam at the stand. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But right now, you're just the international man of mystery. And uh, I agree with Randy. Well, look what Randy's doing it too. Um, I, I would keep that up as long as possible. Um, what about the, the rest of you? Is anyone else here excited for another render dome? Sure. No, it's going to yeah. be good. Always. Awesome. We're do we're doing a conform theme one here. Uh, what do you guys, or what do you all think of, of, of that as opposed to the compositing task we've done before? Yeah, I'm, I, I kind of, I'm dangerously automated, so I would have been out of my depth if I'd done it, you know. So uh, I'd like to see, I'd like to see someone do it in the in the in the more traditional ma method, and I'll see what I'm see what I'm missing. Cool. Hey, uh, Andy, was it planned out to have some pitfalls? Uh, that would um, that would require planning. And so, uh, that's what I mean. That's was it planned out or is it just there. a real job that's going to be thrown at them? Uh, it's going to be as close to a real job as possible, which means, uh, anything, uh, could go wrong at any moment. Make no assumptions that, uh, everything is approved or locked for that matter. Uh -huh. gotcha. Um, we're prepared. There's your, there's your clue, uh, Brian. No, you know, I'm no, just, it's you know, gonna it, go. No, we're gonna start on time. It's gonna be easy, and nothing oh, is no, gonna I'm go wrong. Oh no, I'm not talking about so. the show. That's right. The producer perspective, this. the producer brief, right? Right. <laughs> it's gonna be simple. You know, that's what we get. You can imagine every. I know, with almost, uh, without exception, every conform session that I've been uh, the lead on, I'm told at the beginning exactly what we're gonna be doing. All the elements are organized and named correctly and in one place um all of the you know, er, everything was shot well um on the same camera with the same there's all the clues range. brian <laughs> the edl yeah. matches yeah there's an edl uh the edl is <laughs> manual editing of the edl please. opens <laughs> you know time walks yeah and every rule um, will be untitled or it's right. just an empty folder. We don't know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Just one big empty folder. Figure it out. Yeah. So you never know. I mean, it, it, I, I know I'm, I always, I'm an optimist, which means that I'm usually disappointed. Uh, but I know that uh, you know, I go into every one of these conform sessions knowing that this so, is. So you've long. allocated like three hours for this session. Is that it? <laughs> We've allocated uh, three hours for the session. The first two hours are for emotional support. Um, <laughs> you know, this sounds good. It, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 you know, everyone kind of needs their time to be able to like scream and yell and question their choices and, you know, blame mm -hmm. the client. There is no client this time to blame the client. Um, question their life then, choices. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We do have a breakout <laughs> you know? room. So the, so the crying can be done in, in, in private. Right. I mean, it's recorded and we'll, we'll, it's we'll like the machine later, room, but, but you know, remote. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. For me, um, so, uh, if you want to make it realistic, what you should do is, um, have production ignore at least one of our specs. Yep. <laughs> oh, and we'll be eating delicious food while right. Know, we're all getting we... sushi and charcuterie boards and everything. And... Yeah, and you're just going to be like <laughs> hungry and drinking warm water and eating dry bread. <laughs> yeah, and we're gonna you're gonna have to explain to the client why uh, there are no one by one deliverables, but the deliverables are all six by six, and uh, and and they're not going to be able to understand why. Uh, <coughs> that's a problem, you know? For the difference between the web audio and the broadcast audio. So yeah, figure all that exactly. out. Exactly. Nobody knows and, that. And just, when, you know, with Hang five on, minutes- we're putting go, Brian off. We're putting- Right. <laughs> He's gonna go back to sleep. Um, with, uh, and with five minutes to go, uh, we'll, um, you know, have a surprise call-in guest. It'll be uh, Larry from Extreme Reach. He's one of the QC guys at Extreme Reach in Louisville. And uh, he found something wrong uh, that he finds wrong with the, uh, he thinks when the image plays down, it stutters. And so, yeah. you know, we're going to have to kind of spend the next 45 minutes talking him through that. But that's okay. But Privately, we'll have a discussion whether uh, dual mono pair left and right is the same as stereo or not. Exactly. Yep. So uh, it seems like, uh, it. yeah, that's about no, all of it. Don't, right, for, Brian? Don't, forget the <laughs> don't forget the slates. Yeah, that too. Oh yeah, the, yep. the TikTok disclaimers. Versions, yeah, the TikTok <laughs> versions will be delivered with slates. You know, right? We're gonna have a series of one second uh, four by five deliverables that need to be delivered with ten second slates. Oh, and so, some have two pops, uh, some don't. You'll figure it out. Right. It's fine. Oh, yeah, and by yeah. the way, we need some pre rolls. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're gonna need pre rolls. Uh, everything needs to have uh, subtitles. Uh, and everything's just a cut buttons. down, right? Everything's just a cut down. <laughs> Pure yeah, lift, one hundred percent lift. Basically no extra down. shots. Yeah. So um, to answer your question, John, there'll be no gotchas. This is going to be extremely smooth. <laughs> and um, we're, yeah. we're, we're looking forward to it. The perfect ADL. Yeah. It's great. Like, you know, the, the, it's almost like um, uh, uh, there's a not a bonus round, but it's like the, the obviously whoever gets to the, you know, the end of the task in the amount of time, uh, you know, will you know, we're going to assign a certain amount of points that don't matter and all that kind of thing that, that we've done in the past. But the first person to cry does lose. So um, <laughs> I just want to throw that out there in, in case. You're giving them uh, a anybody... clue on what edit system it was, what offline system it was cut on? CMX 3600. That's the one. Old school. <laughs> Perfect. The one with the joystick, Perfect. the convergence suite. Yeah. Half the people here wouldn't know what 3600. Grass Valley something. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Or Vegas, Sony Vegas or something. Sony. Does that still exists. <laughs> sure. There's one. There's People one running at a, at, a, at a at a TV station. Why. Yeah. What was that, Mike? People love the Sony Vegas. I don't know who does, but they're it's all over the place for like wedding videos and stuff. Oh, well, there you go. Hey. Yep. Uh, there's another clue, Brian. You might be cutting a wedding video. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, uh, crying is my safe word. That's what I'm going <laughs> to Yep. We've got uh, a, a six second piece uh, that's um, uh, it's like 144 frames or whatever at 24. And it consists of 144 one frame fluid morphs. So uh, I hope everybody's prepared for that. That didn't get the last. I got a couple of grins. I was expecting that to go over bigger. Um, but that's what we've got on tap for Render Gnome coming up. Wonderful. I wanted to uh, start the conversation today by asking everyone, uh, how you doing? And uh, so how y'all doing? You know, thumbs up or thumbs down? Let's give it, let's go baseline here. Thumbs up is good. Thumbs down is, could be better. Uh, yeah, somewhere in the middle like this is we see you, we hear you. And um, Richard, what, let me ask you this. What, uh, what's making you feel uh, a little metz of metz? It's cold. Uh... Yes, it's, it's dark and it's been wet. Actually, John's got it wet apparently. Oh, it's terrible here. It's just the pits, but it's good because I've got lots of work to do and I don't think about wanting to go outside. So it's great. 
I think How are you doing six it? Months. Isn't like uh, West Sydney like flooded and they're evacuating it? Yeah. Yeah, well, we're at a point where it's about to get flooded again. Uh, it's getting torrential rain oh. we had yesterday. Um, I haven't tuned into the news jump. to see what disasters are out happening, but, you know. It's like every year I wish you good luck. There's, this, there's another big storm coming. Exactly. Oh, oh wow. sorry, that's a down. I didn't mean to bring everyone there. Yeah, whew. Uh, well, let me, uh, I'll... I'll... Turn this. So everyone who did a thumbs up, right? Uh, is the mm -hmm. thumbs up uh, because you're working on something right now that uh, uh, that challenges you creatively, gets you going? Perhaps, or, or perhaps you've got a, a very lucrative day rate on the job you're working on. Uh, what is it that's giving you a thumbs up? I'm thumbs up because I'm not working on something. Yes, <laughs> I see you're you're out of your normal locale, and you came into this uh, Zoom with a mask on. Uh, yes, I'm I'm in Texas. I'm. Uh... I'm actually running a uh, an AWS plane. I haven't gotten, you know, I just got it set up yesterday here. Um, I tested it for a while in Los Angeles. Um, I, I, I'm here in for, for about a month with family in Texas. And uh, so far, I mean, I haven't done a job with it yet, but I'm really pretty impressed with how responsive it is. And, you know, it looks, looks pretty good. Um, I'm having a little trouble connecting Via, via um, uh, you know, connecting to, to the NAS in another location through Linux, but I'll get that figured out. But everything else mm -hmm. is working pretty good. Tail scale. What's that? Tail scale. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, product Randy turned me on to this week. I'll talk to you later about it. It's point to point VPN, it's like solves all your networking problems. Huh? Okay. Well, the one thing that, uh, you know, I'm sitting here going, wow. So, you know, it runs on my laptop just fine. You know, the, the, now the uh, the sticking point is, you know, a reasonable monitor at whatever location. So I'm looking on Amazon and all over the place for portable monitors. And there don't seem to be any that real candidates. There's like one that's uh, made by Asus, I guess. That's one of those um, art pro, pro art ones, but it's only 14 inches. So it's not quite. But I have a funny feeling within the next 18 months, as this, this sort of technology gets a little more uptake, we're probably going to see some people making, you know, a 24-inch, super thin, super light monitor, and we will be able to be digital nomad. Called an iPad, Maury. Yeah, it's just not not quite big enough, but yeah, that's essentially it. A giant iPad would would be totally fine. I mean, they will unfold would be good, you know, like a. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. I guess <laughs> the client saying, "Why is there a line in the middle of our talent space?" Oh, that's the folding point, right? <laughs> it's just stylistically, we just we'll design our way out of that problem. Um, I guess I, I I wanted to also open up uh, the 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 floor here to a question of how's everybody feeling uh, about the economy, like for the rest of the year, you know. Um, I, I love to ask uh, actual people who are working and not just like read things in the media. Um, do you feel confident about the rest of the year? Do you, are you are you worried? Well, I can tell you, at least for me, throughout the uh, pandemic, I was just totally wall to wall from the beginning to the end. Things stacked up weeks in advance, and basically January one of this year, everything's it, it wasn't that thick anymore. Things I've, I've been busy. Um, I didn't have a I didn't have a particularly good January, um, but it's not like, you know, it's like things are coming up where I don't know what I'm going to be doing, you know, tomorrow and a tomorrow a job. Book. So it's not like this, you know. It, it was this. Everything had lots and lots of lead time, and now it's a little spottier. So I'm I'm a little concerned that the tide is turning. Mm -hmm. I'm at the point of the year where everyone's ringing me again in one go. Like the last week, I've had four phone calls ready to go on four jobs. And that's always hard to juggle when they all have the same similar deadline. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's three shifts in a day, right? <laughs> that's one way to look at it, man. <laughs> nice. Funny, I saw, I saw a spot on air last night for the first time that I actually 
turned away about you know, six, eight months ago because they wanted it turned around in 48 hours. It's like a really badly shot blue screen situation. Great. Um, but it was nice seeing an eye or whoever did it did a good job. But they certainly didn't turn it around in the 48 hours to make their to make their air six months ago. So, but they still they still did it. Mm. Yeah, I found. Uh, I mean, I'm only um, like six, six or seven weeks into the the freelance lifestyle, um, and I, I've I've had my uh, my first bout of like uh, turning away or turning down a job. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just because I I went into this, you know, also committed to achieve some work life balance and that kind of thing, and uh, like an opportunity came up to basically like work a double. Um, and I, I, if my, my every like instinct that I had was like, take it, take it, take it, take it because who knows what's going to happen, uh, whatever next month, you know? Um, but I turned it down. And, Did you uh, turn it down because of an event you had, or you just didn't want to do the number of hours? I didn't want to do the number. I didn't want to do a double essentially, you know, right. I, I didn't want to work 16 hours a day for Are you working months. in a bank or something. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, actually. Yeah. It's an emotional bank, an emotional <laughs> bank. and the vault is empty, Michael. <laughs> it's filled Andy with is, tears. Uh, a college fund bank now at this point. Yes. I got two in, huh? um, uh, and you're not yeah. doing doubles, huh? <laughs> Uh, I was confident about my decision until right about, <laughs> right about now. <laughs> so I'd like to thank this supportive community. Thanks everybody. Well, well, <laughs> Andy, we'll convince you the sun rises in the West in about 10 minutes. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, but yeah, it, 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 maybe I, it, it'd be good to hear from people in, in, uh, in different markets than, you know, New York and LA, um, how they're feeling about, uh, how business is. Is it good? Yeah, it seems to be doing good. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, bro, Michael, you go first. So yeah, out here in Atlanta, the Atlanta job seen a lot slower, but we're making up for it because I'm, I'm doing all the LA and New York jobs that seem to come through and need extra help. So it's balancing out. Gotcha. Bye, Jake. Thanks for, showing, uh, thanks for coming in, man. Uh, Brian, what were you going to say about Dallas? Uh, Dallas seem advertising and commercial seems to be doing okay. We're staying busy. Um, and then also here in Korea, I got a lot of questions about, you know, what kind of hours do you work in the U S and, you know, what are the jobs like? And, and from talking to them, it sounds like they do, uh, they're expected to pull a lot of hours kind of like, I feel like, uh, I did in the early 2000s where there was a lot of work to get done and they, you know, expected you to work those extra hours when the jobs were in. Mm -hmm. So the, and the, the other thing here that was interesting is, you know, Korean culture in general, businesses have a very clear hierarchy and your job title, you know, is very important. So most post houses, there seems to be one or two senior flame artists and then they have a junior and an assistant underneath them. So the senior leads and the junior and the assistant, you know, are at his beck and call. Gotcha. Well, that's interesting. I heard um, something in, also interesting. I had uh, two different conversations with two different uh, uh, clients who are at work in um, episodic TV. Right. And they both mentioned that they had uh, like three different tiers of VFX vendors that they use on their jobs. They had uh, vendors in India. They had vendors in Eastern Europe. And then they had vendors here in the States. And they kind of apportion out the work um, based on, you know, not not that it, it's stuff that can be like simple paint or obviously roto, but you know, simple cleanup, get rid of a boom mic or something like that. 
they send to their uh, vendors in in, uh, in India, and then the vendors in Eastern Europe get stuff that might require either um, uh, a bit more creativity or a bit more of a of a of a uh, like a trusted relationship or a, like a um, not not trust is the wrong word, but uh, a collaborative relationship with uh, the the vendor and the I guess like the VFX supervisor, and then. Um, things that are either uh, super delicate or, um, you know, that much more involved or handled here in the States. But it, it just means that uh, the, it's almost like they, they became aware of the possibility of, of sending work overseas. Um, and so I know, you know, for a while, uh, you know, we were using um, overseas vendors as like our night shift, essentially, you know. And now that that's going direct to client, you know, as opposed to uh, allowing someone like us to be a middleman. So I, don't know, I thought that was kind of an interesting evolution of uh, the state of, of VFX. And I didn't know but if was price answered. involved in that sort of structure. One hundred percent. It was all price. It was really like when they go through the, the show or the, the movie or whatever, and they're spotting all the VFX needs. It's like, you know. Again, some stuff that has to be rotoed or simple cleanup, they can get done dirt cheap by outsourcing it. How many shots are they doing on these shows? Do you know? They said it was anywhere from like 50 to 100 shots an episode. You know, so who knows what that, I, I don't, I never, I haven't seen the content or anything. I don't know what, what it meant, but um, it's kind of an interesting. Yeah, I've done thing. some episodic uh, TV cleanup stuff and at the very beginning they were just offering me x price for x shot mm -hmm. and you know you look at a shot and go yeah okay an hour but then you get stuck on something and it's like two hours but i still got to wear it um, how nice yeah. is it to be sent the offline though to quote on hey go we've got an edit look at these shots how much for uh, for doing these effects it's, that's a that's a rare treat as opposed to just a, a, a theory or an idea yeah right I primarily do episodic work. Um, I'm in LA. Uh, I operate as a small company, not as a freelancer. And I hire out freelancers as I need them. Um, and I do a lot of that, we'll call it fix it work. A lot of uh, everything from TV comps, phone comps, to rig removals, to reflection removals. Um, and I always bid per shot. Um, doesn't always work out, <laughs> um, but I only, I generally only hire really high end flame artists. So, cause I don't micromanage. I like to send somebody a group of shots and when they come back, I want them to be done. You know, of course I'll go over them and then send them off. But, um, and I, you know, I was going to say I'm double booked. Well, I'm booked through February, double booked starting in October. Um, unfortunately, one of the projects is a five episode miniseries for HBO that was supposed to start airing this past Mother's Day, and now it's gotten pushed all the way through February. But another wow. show uh, for HBO starts up in October. So it's going to get a little hairy. And of course, I've notified both shows that, hey, you know, start in October, my priority has to you know, be on this other show that's starting up since the one got pushed. So that's something that I've never really had to deal with uh, that well, something getting pushed that far. Um, and the director refuses to lock anything. I've only seen the first three episodes. I haven't even seen episodes four and five yet. Um, and it's very odd. I'll go weeks without hearing from them, which is normally people are like, Let's see some shots. And, you know, I literally haven't haven't sent a shot in in probably a month and a half. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's really frustrating because for me, it's uh, it, it's not really making me want to work on their show. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I love doing the episodics. I love doing the fix it kind of work and not the not the more creative stuff because it doesn't go back and forth. It's fixed or mm -hmm. it's not, mm. you know, I, I've done this long enough to where I'm not going to send something that's not fixed. 
and um, you know, it, it works out pretty well. Yeah, I found uh, on on the uh, episodic or, or long form stuff, I enjoy that aspect of it as well. You know, that uh, there may be a pile of stuff to do, uh, but generally it's it's a known, it's a given, and they tell you exactly what they want. And then it's really up to you to manage the time and the task. And so, like, you know, when I was looking at some of this, uh, some of this stuff and, uh, and what the client was offering, you know, per shot, it, my mind started to go like, well, okay, uh, so how many shots would I have to crank through in a day, you know, in order to make this either viable or, or whatever? And it seems like a, it seems like an interesting challenge. Hi, Renee. They keep having me up my bids. Hi. They keep having you increase your bids? They yeah. add money? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Well, that's, that's, that's a, a tough problem to have right there. <laughs> yeah. There's one in every crowd, Wayne. <laughs> uh, that's great. What, All what, right. fraction, what fraction of the people here are staff and what fraction are freelance? Uh, raise your hand if you're on staff. Staff. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven from Burned. Okay. And freelance? Uh, one, two, uh, Randy's three. All right. John is kind of... Uh, um, I work from home, but I, I never go into a facility. I just, the job comes to me, I do it at my place. Uh -huh. So I'm kind of a mini facility, if you like. Mm-hmm. One-man band facility. Right. Well, uh, what's everyone been working on lately? My tan. I can. Yeah, and you know what? It it, it it's 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 a good. You got a good base there, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a good a good even base. You do realize that means going out in the sun, right? Oh, it, oh! I thought it was just you could do that with hue lights. Okay, good. Yeah. Time. No, no. Well, that's what mm -hmm. I've got going on here. The I've dialed in the color temperature on these lights here, and it, it's really, it's, it's nice. It makes me look healthy. Studio uh, tan. Exactly, which is the name of my uh, upcoming album. Um, I've been working on something cool. I've been working on a spot. Of course, I can't say what it is or anything like that, but it's been, uh, it's the first, like, uh, like, a TV spot that I've worked on since going freelance. And uh, when I first got the material, I was, um, like, it, it, I kind of, uh, uh, went into like panic mode of like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Uh, and then I, I realized after the first day that like, I don't have anything else to do but this, you know, as the lead flame artist at, at a studio, I had to do the challenging stuff and solve the problems. But there were also all the other things you have to do as the lead artist at a studio, whether it was like um, Facebook, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> figuring out what to go, what to have for lunch. Sorry. Um, you know, talking with Randy, but I, uh, I, I'm loving it. It was, uh, it's a, it was a challenging green screen, I'm sorry, blue screen shoot. And, um, I had to do some 3d tracking. So I, I just recently learned synth eyes. And so I did a, a camera track with synth eyes and made some geo <coughs> and Randy helped me, uh, remember how to orient the camera. So it matched the, the world that it was going in. Um, and you know, exported an FBX and loaded it in and worked like, mwah, it was wonderful. Uh, I've had to do a lot of painting, like with wash. And uh, that's been kind of awesome. So that's what I did. Did you give the flame tracker a go before synthize? Or you just knew that it, it was a synthize job? I well, I wanted it to be a synthize job. I wanted to, I, I had learned it, I had used it on a job recently for the first time. But it had been a couple weeks. And I didn't want it to go stale. And as soon so, as you buy uh, a license, you just have to, you know, sunk cost fallacy. So, you got to make sure it works. So that's what I did. I bought a license, <laughs> and now I'm going to use it, like, regardless, yes. you know. So, uh, yeah, that's what I've been working on, and uh, it, it's been cool. Like, uh, I, 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 I'm liking it. I, think I have similar experience to you, Andy. Maybe it's because we just had a podcast on Synthize, but um, I had a job come in, and unlike all the episodic work, it's a commercial, so I have no idea what they're going to give me when it arrives and it was all sorts of gnarly cleanup and it was just me no no uh, no 3d support no um outsourcing budget and i thought all right i'm gonna give synthize a crack and 
it was amazing. And I was accepting some shocking tracks from myself just because they were so much better than a bad track from Flame. I was loving it. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah, it was really good. Cool. My first, my first toe dipped into synthesizers. It, uh, it was a good experience. Now, do you think you would have gotten a better, uh, a, a similar track coming from Mocha or something like that, or just it would not have happened on something? Maybe. I mean, I've never, I've never left Flame for tracking. This is the first time I've left Flame, unless someone is going to do it for me. Um, that's what I mean. So I, I was getting some really bad synthized tracks, but they were still a hell of a lot better than my Flame tracks. So, yeah, and I'll this take a bad a, track. I can always, I can always patch it up in Flames. Certainly, if it's clean up and stuff, I'm not trying to get a creature to walk solidly on the floor. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, get rid of some rigging and stuff. Yeah, it was really good. I was doing set extensions, and so I really, I like, I, I needed geo to be in the right space and you know it needed to make like the corner of a, of a wall and track it through and everything and then uh unbeknownst to me a few days later they um you know they the, a request came in to uh like add some signage in the space as well which was not on the back wall or on the side wall and so it was like it immediately it became a no-brainer because i had a camera track for that shot as opposed to uh you know if i had done a, like a series of 2d tracks or something like that mm. so so that was cool. I had something cool the other day. I was doing, a, I, I ended up, for some reason, when I get bored, I start lurking on Reddit and then start helping individuals with really weird cleanup shots. Because sometimes people post on Reddit, like, I, I have this cleanup shot. And, and I, did a, I did a favor for someone. And then a few weeks ago, he called me with a small budget of needing to de-blur some footage he had shot, which was just okay. like anamorphic footage. It was just a little bit out of focus. And so... Um, uh, based on Andy's suggestion, I racked up uh, Video Topaz. They have a, a still frame uh, machine learning and AI de-blur tool that makes stills. So I just grabbed every 100th frame from the sequence and then used that to train a copycat inference mm. to, uh, to de-blur three and a half minutes of footage in a couple of days. Pretty, pretty auto, auto magically. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that was a good demo. That was, yeah. Yeah, it was cool. Hey, with the whole copycat pie box thing, you need the nuke on the same physical box as your flame, correct? You can't like network it out to someone, you know, some other one, right? Uh, can you? Actually, I think it has to be local. I think you should be. It renders in the background. You could maybe theoretically frame server it on nuke, but. Well, do you, you mean after the training is done? Like after you have your, your, the tool there? Wherever the actual, wherever the nuke is. Yeah. I, I'm just not sure with Pybox if it has to, if the nuke or whatever, whatever outboard application you're Pi boxing in to it has to be on the same physical machine as your flame. Well, you need, it needs to be exec executable from wherever the machine can either access or there's a slight chance, but I think you should just. Like Nuke is, so you, you can install Nuke on anything. So I would just install Nuke and pull a license from something. That's probably your best bet. Great. Yeah. And I think you could pull a render license. It doesn't have to be an interactive. So technically, if you forked out 600 bucks, you'd get a render license and you could use it that way. So. Are you guys both doing the machine learning on a single box though? Andy? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Was it, was it time, was it time consuming overnight kind of thing? Um. It, it can be anywhere from like two to 12 hours. I mean, it just, it depends on like how, how, what resolution you're working at and then mm -hmm. how many frames are in your, uh, your data set. Mm. Yeah. So I started breaking shots up and like, you know, 13 shots, two of them are the same. Three of them are the same. Five of them are the same. Two of them are the same. Is that a 13? Um, something like that. And so you just build these groups. And so you don't have to, you know, once you have something figured out for a shot, it'll work for all the same setups, which is rarer in, in commercial world, of course, um, mm -hmm. but more common in films and camera setups. So it just depends. But, you know, you could, t you could technically throw a couple A6000s at it. And, you know, what used to be, you know, three to six to nine hours could, te could theoretically be, you know, something usable and in an hour or two and then maybe refine, but it just becomes part of the, of the recipe. And so there's different ways to mix and match. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting. It solves some problems that we used to never be able to solve before, which is, well, yeah, you put us in a pickle now. Cause I always, I always used to say, you can't, you can't refocus a defocus shot. I'm sorry. If you shot it out of focus, it's, you know, Richie, I'll send you my email address and I'll invoice you. <laughs> <laughs> I found two, um, 
again, I have, I have a, an A6000, uh, but I found this also on a, a P6000 uh, on the older machine um, that I could do the training and run flame at the same time, and it was fine. You know, I didn't really see a hit. Sure. I'm a little bit afraid that with all the tools we get in the last years, the client will say, hey, come on, they can fix it in post. Why should we care at the shoot now? Mm -hmm. They always yes. do. Yeah. yeah. Why should they start now? You know? Well, their time is their time is incredibly valuable. You know, in the larger shows with a quarter million dollar U.S. shoot day, which is what, 200000 euros per day you know like okay if it's going to cost us 10 minutes and we can pay we can pay burn to fix it it's not a bad idea or is it <laughs> it depends on if you, who, whoever's doing the task I guess. exactly <laughs> right and i finished an interesting job recently uh -huh. another burn burner i think from from shoot to delivery was four days and it was a, a, a two and a half minute uh, TV spot that had a two and a half minute version, a 30 second version and everything under the sun. It was like a, an eighties retro um, music video looking thing for, uh, for Amazon. Uh, it was a lot. And, you know, they were still shooting while we were, we were starting. We had to do, you know, clean up to uncolor you know, to the flat plate color would come in and redo everything from color that paint. and just after we delivered the thing get a notice from the facility hey uh you had a COVID exposure so start testing <laughs> <laughs> yep enjoy first the time, weekend first time i've been into a facility in a long long time and there you have welcome <laughs> and welcome back Amanda, what have you been working on? Oh, hey. Hi. Um, I, I, got, I worked on a short film last August with this production company I got introduced to. It was like a kung fu film, so of course I'm going to work on it um, and worked on some shots for them. And then they actually reached out to me uh, maybe about like five months ago or four months ago and said they had another short film they were working on. And it was probably around like 17 shots, so it was probably going to take me like all weekend. And I was just asking the producer, like, tell me more about this film. Tell me more about the character. So uh, it was a guy that had transitioned to a female. And the story was, is based on a true story, is that her boyfriend would hide her. So whenever they had friends over, she would have to hide in the bathroom. And this was all kind of crammed into 20 minutes. And it was really well shot. Um, and so yeah, whenever friends came over, hide in the bedroom, hide in the bathroom. And then eventually she got sick of it and was kind of wanted to confront him. There's texts on your phone. Are you cheating? What's going on? You don't want to show me off. And it was kind of this very manipulative relationship about like, you know, nobody will understand you like how I do. Uh, so yeah, so they turned into a big fight. He ends up like stabbing her. Like I said, this is based on a true story. And then, you know, like six months later, she's fine. She's doing well. And then she walks outside of her apartment and the guy's truck is there. And then it's like end scene. So it was like a really emotional short for something like this. And then as I got talking to the producer, um, you know, she wants to spread more of a message. This is really big deal. This is her first directing and starring. So I was like, you know what, just buy me lunch. And so I just worked all weekend on a film that I really felt really like, I was really drawn to. It's a really nice film. It was really, really well shot. So I like the cause, I like the message. So I thought that was cool too. And then they got in touch with me just last week and said they have like a million dollar film coming up and. They've got a whole bunch of other stuff coming up and want to get me involved with that too. So I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I really like the message that this company is, is doing. So it was a lot of fun. Sweet. Yeah, That's it great. was good. Yeah. And then also my other, on, on the side project I'm doing too, I post about it in Logic is that I'm trying to get like a flame course for the school in Detroit that I went to. So this is something that I've been working with in the school. And the cool thing is I, you know, I have the backing of the school. I have the backing of Autodesk. And then I'm also like in trying to work with Sense Labs to see what we can do about getting some tablets for the students. So it's it's kind of coming a little bit into this very weird moldy shape for the foundation, but now it comes into, and I've talked with actually some of you guys about it. Um, thank you so much for your time <laughs> of like how we can get this thing going and off the ground. Cause as we've mentioned before, there's kind of like a generation gap happening with flame. 
Um, and so I reached out to my alma mater, the co this college I went to and graduated from, and they were just so excited. And they're just like, how much, what do you want? Do whatever you want. So we have like full reign to do whatever it is that we can do to kind of get this off the ground. So this is something I've been working the past year really intensely with the school, trying to figure out how we can get a flame program in there. And they're very much open to anything. So uh, I've been talking with a lot of artists, how we can get demos in there and like, how do we make this a thing for them? And it's in Detroit too. So there's a lot of talent that comes out of Detroit. Isn't that right, Renee? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hope yeah. we're gonna find even more of it with this meetup we're just trying to get together. You gonna come out that? Group. I'm gonna try. Yeah. I'm gonna try. Awesome. Oh my God, that would be super cool. <laughs> Uh, so I had a I had a technical thing this week. Uh, I guess you can call it a technical thing. So uh, I've been working the last week, and uh, it's the first uh, time I was working on my local flame. Uh, all the other freelance work I've been doing, I've been remoting in, right? And so I got the beast behind me there, and the room that I'm in is just like the guest room in my house, and it was getting like it was sweltering in here. I mean. So for like the, I, I finally have had to start thinking about how to manage the heat <laughs> in this room. Uh, I mean, I have, I have like a window air conditioner. Uh, I had a fan hooked up for a while, like a clip on fan from my kid's dorm room, like, you know, trying to blow the, the hot air coming out of the machine just to scatter it. So it didn't end up in the corner. Um, I kind of resigned. I, I'm so I was I'm just curious. I was curious. Anybody else who has a, a, a ton of gear at home. What are you doing uh, to manage the heat that these machines? I don't exhale. Right. That's how I'd help. Fans. Yeah. And close your window. We have a south facing window and we close the blinds so that it's not like the heat isn't beating down in there and then open the doors and put fans in. And also yeah. if you're anywhere near your basement, we have a, the basement has a stairwell with a <laughs> very cheaply just it was an idea but it's working um we got like a piping from i don't know my husband hooked it up it's some kind of like ducting that we hooked to a fan and we have it facing up to the main floor and so we are basically exchanging air and it works really well mm -hmm. oh cool I recommend living at the beach absolutely. yes that's i was uh, that thinking too. about that um but then I thought about going with something like Renee suggested. <laughs> uh, actually, I have like I have an electrician coming out to run uh, the power to this room just on its own circuit in the you know on the circuit panel. So he has to run like conduit outside the house and everything. And at first it was just like let's just let him run power. And then I went down to the basement uh, the other day and it was like I don't know forty five degrees cooler than it is in this room here. And so I was like hmm maybe I should also have him run some either some fiber. Or, Why don't you move your you know, office to the basement? Uh, two, th four reasons, actually. Oh, uh, my son, my daughter, mind. both cats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a room that, like, they use, you know, when they're home. And they're not home a lot because they go to college. But for the time being, um, I'm, I've got to stay up here. But I thought, you know, I could throw the... Yeah, put the gear down, down there. there. You'll, you'll yeah. enjoy the silence as well. That's what I yeah, did. Exactly. I moved all my gear out of the room I'm sitting in now to another room, which is basically it's under the house and there are no windows and it's nice and cool in there. And the sound, I can't he hear the drives spinning anymore. And it's fantastic. I love the silence. Yeah, I think I have to do that. In the last month, I've added uh, one, two, two computers to this room that weren't here a month ago. And uh, I put a, a, an exhaust fan uh, in the little like shelving unit I have back there, like a PC exhaust fan because my, my Synology is in there and I just wanted to keep airflow going. And so it, it gets loud. Like <laughs> When everything's on, yeah. it's like the, the fans yeah. get loud in here. So I, I think I might what do that. What was that, that Andy? Move the gear. What? I said, I said the fans. Yeah, I, I think I might, uh, I might do that. I might move the stuff um, down to the basement. And just, I don't know. I got to figure that out too. How would I connect to everything? I guess it would be all like... Uh, Right, I can go all Teradici or RGS or whatever, but then... Uh, not for long. Not for much longer, right? Nope. All these people that have basements that don't live in LA. Yeah. <laughs> What's a basement? Why do you exactly. say not for long for Teradici or RGS? Because in a month they're going to 
HP anywhere. And so all of our GS and all of Teraguchi licensing will be a minimum of five. Isn't licenses. that already the case for Teraguchi? It is for Teraguchi, but not for our, not for HP zero mode boost. Right. So anybody want to go in have these? <laughs> Do a group buy. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I might take you up on that, Randy. What is sort that of money is involved? Uh, in the well, HP Zero Mode Boost used to be cheap. I mean, if it was free, if you had an HP box, uh, then uh, if you want to buy a license for non HP, it was, I don't know, three, four, five hundred bucks tops, which is a direct connectable, so it's really easy. But now with Teraguchi, you need a CAC, a CAS, a CAM, lot, you need all kinds of crazy stuff that. You, that, you, don't, you don't need any of that. You could still I do know, it, but, they, but they say they do. So you could still do a direct connection. It, it's frustrating when they, it, it's 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 a it's an odd place when you when you're that small, um, because they still don't really understand how to serve small. I mean, they're just not designed for it, so it's it's a frustrating spot to be in. Randy, is that a full size rack you got in the background there? So you got all your gear in the room. Mm -hmm. But right? he's in a basement. Yeah, in the basement. In the basement. They make um 150 foot. Uh, uh, display port cables. <laughs> they make fifty. No, that's fine. You can use fifty foot. They're, those work fine. Yeah. I mean, don't forget. Auto, I mean, Flame used to ship with one of those what? Those Avon View Active DVI Display Port thingies. That and a USB, and you know, for five, five for like four, five hundred bucks per workstation, you can extend something fifty feet, which is fine for most residentials. You can get like a 300 foot HDMI cable from, from a uh, mono price for like 50 bucks. Then you can convert it after the fact too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are options. Isn't that like good luck if that works? I, I've got a 300 foot HDMI working right now. It's fine. Yeah. Wow. They make these fiber optic display port and HDMI cables that are super reliable and yeah. quite thin actually. All right, cool. Yeah. That's not too bad. Yeah, because this this would go into like a metal conduit that's going to go from you know, that would go around the outside of my house to get uh, from yeah. where all that is in the basement. You know what else that's there. called, Andy? A lightning rod. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bring it. That's what I say. Who else? Who's working on something cool, or has bought something cool, or is thinking about buying something cool? We just received our newest Threadripper 5995 WX yesterday. And? Jesse likes it. He says it's okay. fast. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Anyone, anyone using nice DCV for um, remoting for remote work? That's only available on AWS, I believe. Oh, is that right? And I think, that, I think they have like, you can buy a, a server and a client. Pretty sure. But I'm using it on AWS. For pretty good. Excellent. So, so when you're buying an AWS system, how exactly do you do you get that? Do you because like back in the old days, you know, if, you, if I wanted to flame, I go to you know, I, I go to Keycode or somebody. I call up Michael Gorek. You know, he just sets me up with a with a box and a license. I'm good to go. Nowadays, like, where do you go to get the cloud system? I'm I'm very unclear on AWS.Amazon.com. You say, hi, I want a flame, or like you just want you no. a server, or no, that's where you I did it using I did it using a guy in London, um, the company's consistent computing. It took them took a little while to get it going, but once it didn't take that long to get going. And I think uh, I think it's gonna get shorter and shorter. And I and I and I have heard through the grapevine that um, at some point soon there'll be an announcement that someone's gonna make a a click for flame product. So it's not there yet, but uh, wouldn't gun one of the options. Be another... Sorry, Jim. So as is that going to be one of the options at AWS? So like here, Flame, or is that through through your guy? It's through a it's through another yet another party putting Got it. something like that. There's yeah. nothing as a middleman then. They're they're, they're just pre-configuring these 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 virtual servers. Yeah, I think that the concept that this that this other party has. Is basically, you know, click for your flame for however long you want it, and log off. And you know, PayPal him the money, and he'll he'll deal with Amazon. So couldn't uh, you do the same with gunpowder? 
they you just commission them to set you up a flame and then sure, sure could but i don't yeah. think that they have i don't think they have like a self serve sort of situation And quite frankly, I, I tried. I tried to get uh, gunpowder to, to help me, and I wrote him letter after letter. I never heard anything back from him. So, yeah, I think right now, it, whoever, regardless of who it is, you need like a uh, a specialist, you know, like a systems integrator or whatever to configure yeah. all the AWS cloud stuff. So all the you know you get as a um, like a front end. He's a plug for Call Jack, I guess. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, are all the all the the usual suspect system integrators doing that now? Are they still, you know, locked in the old hardware, you know, world where you know they want to they want to sell you a bunch of uh, you know, a bunch of boxes? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think that it's still a pretty rarefied group of. I think there's only a very few people worldwide right now that are catering to our type of person for these AWS. I think that's another. Uh, I can tell you another interesting thing here in Korea. The reseller also does engineering support and none of the post houses have their own engineers. They call the mm -hmm. reseller and they send a guy to the facility to come, you know, fix stuff. And they're also uh, really deep into setting up cloud machines. When we were talking about uh, setting up the master classes, they spun up a machine for me, gave me a login. I, loaded all my material and like practiced my, you know, uh, lessons with that machine and then flew to Korea and I didn't bring any, I didn't bring a laptop. I didn't bring a hard drive. I just got here, started up the same machine and everything was there. And the, uh, their IT guy seems to have some kind of app on his phone. I couldn't communicate with him real well, but he has an app on his phone where he could spin up and spin down uh, cloud machines for, you know, internal use for themselves. So whenever I needed something, he just had like a little pull down and it looked like he was clicking, you know, flame, neat video, OFX plugins. And then that machine was ready a couple minutes later. Wow. Probably texting gunpowder. <laughs> just I told him that that was, that was impressive for compared to the situation in America and I don't know if they want to try to, uh, through communication barriers, work with flame artists in America, but that people would be, you know, willing to pay for that. I think. Yeah, that that sounds a lot like that thing I was mentioning to you, but not ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. When I was. Adam Taylor, how are things uh, over in the UK, my friend? Um. It's bizarre. Really? <laughs> <We've>, uh, yeah. <laughs> We're still in the throes of a crazy government, but I just... Oh, well, who is it? Uh, you know? Oh, I'm, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Um, as far as bu buying new stuff, I've just had solar panels fitted on the house. Really? Which is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I'm still waiting for the battery. That's on a ship somewhere between here and China. Mm -hmm. um, but we are hoping for eight to nine months of the year just to be running off the power of the sun. Oh, that's be great. great. Because how how much I mean, does the, like, did the panels generate then? Um, they can generate the ones we've got. We've got fourteen of them on the roof, and they generate about up to five and a half kilowatts an hour in good weather. Wow. Um, so we're, we're going to get a an eight kilowatt battery that mm -hmm. will charge up, run the house during the night, during the daytime, it'll be running off the solar panels and any excess gets fed back into the network and we get paid for it. So Excellent. <laughs> it's it's going to reduce the, the overheads, you know, the bills and things quite a lot, I hope, mm -hmm. which is good because at the moment we're having a, a really bad fuel crisis in this country. Prices are skyrocketing for everything. I mean, petrol. Yeah, it, you're looking at two quid a day, two quid a litre. Wow. Which I was talking to someone who, who was who was talking to his friend in America. And we worked out that's probably about what you pay nine or ten quid a gallon. Mm -hmm. It's just mad. So I think my Same story here. Right two dollars yeah. fifty a litre. 
mad, isn't it? It's crazy. Oh, we're, yeah. we're getting yeah. there. It's like <clears throat> broke seven dollars a gallon here, Los Angeles. Yeah, I wish ours was I that cheap. I was looking at solar uh, last year and uh, couldn't. It's not that I couldn't justify the cost, but it was like you know, it was in the, the math problem was well, what is my electric bill per month, and then how long will it take to recoup the investment of mm. putting the panels the, the on? way we're looking at this is it's not so much how long it takes to recoup it because we've kind of realised that if you've got the money in the bank to buy the stuff outright straight away you could instantly be getting £100 back every month in what you're saving on your electric. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to take... I mean, if you had that in the bank at the moment, you would get nothing. The interest rate is practically right. zero. So if you can afford to buy them, you're going to be getting a return of whatever your electricity bill would have been every month. And the, the way the prices are going up, I reckon in four years we'll have paid for it. And then everything after well, that is free electric. Yeah. Well, so our power that, bill here uh, went up to, you know, it's over $500 a month now, whereas before... A month? It, 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 yeah, I it's get, some, crazy. get some solar panels. <laughs> uh, well, some lunatic got a, an electric car with a big, big battery. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> well, all you, of a sudden... You can, charge, you can charge them from the solar panels? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it again now. It's definitely worth it. It's two, a minefield, but it's definitely worth it. Two looking quid into. a liter is nine bucks a gallon. Yeah, that's pricey. We also have solar panels, just good for solar over here, too. Mm -hmm. mm. There's one yeah, fringe yeah. that is pushing everyone towards these more, you know, ecological, yeah. environmental, you know, like, like COVID and lockdown forced everyone to get a little bit more um, remote and savvy and, and you know, online mm. and stuff. You know, this, this, this this crisis that we're in at the moment, you know, everyone can go out get an electric bike or an electric car and think about solar panels. It's got to be, you know, there's got to be some kind of, kind of silver lining, isn't there? You know? Hopefully. Yeah. Well, we looked, at, I mean, we looked into it when we were in LA and it didn't make any sense for us because we were running super lean and we don't have big electricity bills, but we always wanted to get them. And then as soon as we moved to Michigan, it was just a no brainer because there's so many, I mean, we had a lot of power outages in LA, but it was a really big deal where we live here. And we have a battery backup now, and we generate about 80% of our power on the solar panels, and we get one-to-one mm -hmm. -one back from the energy company. We were grandfathered in. They don't do that anymore now. But I think it's totally worth it. You should, If you can do it, just do it. We don't get anything like one-to-one -one back in the UK, but anything back is better than nothing. <laughs> right. Hey John, what company was it where you could send your electricity and they'll give you beer? There was, there was one brewery in Australia. <laughs> There's one brewery in Australia who runs their own solar farm and they, they, they put an offer out and it was, yeah, you, rather what? than selling. This is a true electric, story. Yeah, true story. Rather than selling your electricity. Why haven't I heard about this? What's going rather, on? Rather Tell than me quick. Back to the grid. You can sell it back. To, I, think I think it's I'm in the market beer. for solar and I want yeah, to get a free they, beer. They pay, you back, they pay you back in beers. It was great. It was really good. Awesome. It was one of the highlights from uh, Award Awards this year, John, I must admit. That and the Rex owner armpit um, advertising, which I thought was pretty cool. As well. <laughs> my trouble is finding someone reputable to put solar on my roof. Yes, yeah. hearing yeah. horror stories on this in this country, and I just don't want to get someone bad to put crappy equipment in. Well, Australia yeah. was um, subsidised for a while, wasn't it? Still is. Yes. Yeah, so so you, I'm, you... I'm ready to jump into it. I just got to find someone. That, yeah, what, that I can we trust. Spent an off, we spent an awful lot of time trawling through Facebook groups to do with solar power, and we kind of found the people that we thought would be a good, a good fit through that. Really, um, and what's the lifespan on these this, batteries, Adam? What's that? What, or or, or I think it's about ten, 10 years, years, isn't it? So. Yeah, three hundred and seven. It takes beers. ten years to pay it off, though. That's the that's yeah. the weird part, right? But then I've, the battery in my car is supposed to be five years and the car's about 12 years old and it's still going strong. So. Are you talking so, about the 12-volt battery or the electric car battery? I, I've got a hybrid. It's, it's the big okay. lithium thing in the boot. Right. So, 
they, they reckon it's a five year one or five to seven years but the car's 12 years now so and it's as good as it does anyone here own a tesla yeah so what's it what how long, how long have you had the tesla for 2017 i got mine 2017 okay and when's the battery going to be due to be replaced who knows i mean it's fine and they're they're warranty for eight years i think it is yeah and um you know, I, I've, I've really seen no degradation in the uh, in, in my mileage. Maybe a couple of miles, but nothing nothing outstanding. I expect it to last at least fifteen years. Okay. And do you know what the cost of the a replacement battery? Will you replace the battery or replace the car? Honestly, I don't know. I'll probably replace the car because by then the technology will be so bad that uh, you know you want something newer, something newer and funner. Even though right now I've got unlimited supercharging, so. You know, that's like one of those nice things to have in the back pocket. Sure. Okay. Cool. I go, gang. Fuck yeah. Take nice care, Mark. See you, everybody. See you later. See ya. Bye. Bye. Oh, I'm, trying to I'm trying to decide between a Tesla or an electric golf cart. <laughs> mm. No brainer. I live at the beach. I drive about five miles a day. So in the cart might be your it might be the way to go there, man. Yeah, except the rare occasion I get on the freeway. Yeah, do it's, it. It's slow for the freeway. <laughs> do it. Just stay in the right lane. You'll be fine. Yeah. Or other electric June bikes. By the... <laughs> yeah, Burn makes a good uh, good point there. Get like an electric like a dune buggy. You know, like more like it's a big cage. You know, and just giant rear wheels. You know. Put like a state flag or a you know something like that on it, um, and then just just have like you know ride the Valkyries uh, on loop and just wham just go man. All right. <laughs> the good reaction. Eh? Well, there you go. You know. Um, does anyone have anything else that they want to share? Uh, stuff that they've been working on or. Uh, Anything like that? I've been having to really I'm, make I'm, a commercial. I'm happy that I solved my space issue. I was doing a job this week and Oh yeah, right. I started with like, you know, one and a half terabytes of free space on my drive. And then I'm just, you know, plowing through some shots and thinking, wow, it's already dropped to like six hundred gigs. Where's all this space gone? And I'm freaking out because I've got so many more shots to do. And I'm thinking, oh, where am I going to find this space? So, and then it just kept dropping and dropping. And I thought, there's got to be something wrong here. So I started looking through the flame uh, store folders. And I could see folders there that were 500 gigs in size. And I thought, what's in there? You know, like, what's going on? And that's when I realized that I accidentally cached in an 18-minute clip at 4K, 16-bit. <laughs> That'd do it. That was one of them. And the other one was a couple of motion vector passes. And I didn't realize that um, when you when, a mo when I cached the motion vector pass, it was a, like a 500 frame clip. Um, the, it, it, yeah, it takes up that much space, but then I iterated and then I think I did it again. I flushed it because it didn't work properly. I thought I'd do another one. And then it generated a second one so bang another 500 gig just disappeared on on two <laughs> motion vector analysis anal analysis <laughs> um yes yes and so that's where like one and a half terabytes of data just disappeared or one terabyte of data just disappeared really quickly so i had that was when i was thinking geez i made a really bad decision buying the four terabyte um, max studio instead of the eight terabyte max oh studio. okay yes i saw this on uh on the on the forum or i'm yeah. sorry on discord right yeah discord yeah and i thought oh yeah, yeah. gee and then i was uh, just thinking do i buy another piece of buy more storage externally and i thought no i'm not going to get the speed and it's going to cost me you know blah 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 all those thoughts go through your mind but then I thought, no, I'm going to find out why I just clobbered a terabyte of data and I found it, which was good. I'm happy now. <laughs> hey, Alan, can I ask you a question? 
What's up? Okay, are you still using your wide monitor for the dual monitor set up on Flame? And Absolutely. does that work remotely? Yeah, RGS it works great. So you can do a dual monitor through RGS. Do you need it like a, a any kind of special setup for that, or do you need a second like video output for it? No, no. Cool. The, Thank you very much. So he, here's the key with RGS. The limitation is uh, so. RGS, it takes the resolution from the sender and Teradici takes the resolution from the receiver and they each have a, a UHD, a, a single monitor limitation of UHD. So if you're using RGS, you have to make sure that your sender doesn't have a single monitor resolution that's greater than UHD. So in the case of the 5K by 2K monitors, we set them up logically to act as two monitors. With Teradici, it ignores the sender resolution and takes receiver resolution. So you have to make sure that your 5K by 2K monitor on the receiver is set up as two logical monitors with one being no greater than UHD resolution. So two different philosophies for each, each of the products, but it works equally well. Got it. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. What's everybody using for backups? I'm still using a very old LTO3 drive that's SCSI that I have to keep limping along an old Mac Pro with the SCSI card just to do my backups. So I'm either going to switch to a more current LTO or if somebody has something else that's a better idea. I'm using to... LTO7, yeah, you know, been, have been for a while, you know, I've got some old LTO5s that it still reads, you know, so, because I've got to get back to stuff that a lot of times that it's, you know, six, seven years or 10 years sometimes, you know, depending on, because these facilities end up, you know, it's a long cycle before you end up updating anything, but yeah, it, it still works good. It's, it's, I'm using a Thunderbolt uh, LTO and it's, yeah, it works great. Yeah, we're moving up from LTO5. I think we're going to LTO9. So we're in that silly situation where we're trying to do generational leaps, which you might need to consider, Wayne, because you, you probably don't want to go, what is it, two generations? So you don't want to go LTO3 to LTO5, which is ancient as well. But yeah, to get to LTO9, we're going through a little generational leap kind of thing, which seems a little bit of a palaver, but you know, someone else is looking into that. So Yeah, it used to be where you... It used to be where you'd have it go back two generations. I think now it only goes back one generation with the new, with the newer ones. Um, so oh, it's wow. even more of a problem. Yeah, I believe that's correct. So yeah, it's not a magic bullet like it used to be. Mm -hmm. Wayne, how much data do you need a year? Oh, you're muted, sir. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I will probably fill up. Uh, let's see, probably, that's probably 20 terabytes a year. Is this for disaster recovery or for long-term archival? Long-term archival. I mean, I, I've almost never had to go back to anything because mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, I don't think you were on earlier. I'm mostly doing, doing features and, and episodic work, which you never have to go back to. Um, but you know, uh, I'm, I'm always super careful. So I, I keep everything. Well, for uh, that, you could, I mean, you could, you could maybe think about just compressing it, which I know is a controversial thought. And then just going up to Wasabi, uh, which is six bucks a month per terabyte. And then you can keep that around for a year. You know, I kind of do the same, but I'm, I'm usually under 15 terabytes of like stuff I'm actively. So like the 90 bucks a month for me is worth it because once I have a physical thing that I need two of those, I need one of them in a vault somewhere in some off location, something. So it's not perfect, but so if you can get that 20 down, you know, down into, you know, under 21, <laughs> under yeah. not drinking age number of terabytes. Um, but doesn't it take ages to restore something from the cloud? Like, you know, I mean, if you had to move If you never terabyte. need it. <laughs> It takes zero time. <laughs> yeah, true. But when you do need it and it takes four days to get it back, the job no, doesn't, doesn't take four days. I mean, if it's what each project might be, what a few terabytes, Wayne, like, you know, like depending on, I mean, or what's, yeah. what's one show like 10 T or what's one show. Um, you know, it really varies. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. Yeah. 
um, the challenge yeah. that I'm facing is our, our active data set is like 500 terabytes. So it's really hard to, it's almost impossible to have that as a online cloud storage. So we have a LT07 robot, but that's mostly for disaster recovery. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our long-term archival depends on the show requirements and the contractual requirements, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of an awkward size and time, isn't it, Wayne? It's like, you know, you can kind of go either way and it's right. just whatever stinks less, I, I suppose. Hey, Alan, do any of your shows actually request archives to be sent to them? As of yet, none of our VFX shows are the trailers we do. We we do send an archive to the studio of the trailers, but the VFX shows have not requested any archival material that gets sent to them. Yeah, that, that's my experience as well. Yeah, we basically wait until the, the, the film or whatever it is has been released, and then we'll put it to long-term storage and delete it from our active data set. But we always wait till it's been released and for a few weeks. We did have one show come back. This was like seven years ago and when HDR kind of first started up and they needed us to re-deliver some elements that they had lost because they were remastering for HDR. But that, that only happened one time like seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know in my, in my conversations with, with Randy, especially after that very first Logic Live you did and, and brought up the whole concept of compressing the shit out of your archives and sending them up to Wasabi. I, I had been firmly in the camp of like, let me get two drives and back everything up to the two drives and have a clone and keep them on a shelf and um, nothing's ever come back. Like nothing, you know? So if, it, if, if I did have to bring it back, I'll download. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a convert now. You know, if I did have to bring it back, I think the largest job I've worked on was uh, a little over two terabytes. Uh, so then why are you feeling that Wasabi is a better solution for you than just doing a, a drive backup on your, you know, on your shelf? Isn't uh, that cheaper in the long run? Not, not, well, not really. What happens because if like, the liability is fire? First, first, you're buying the drives and I would buy two. So even if they were like a hundred bucks a drive, it's $200, you know, and then, um, I mean, I have a box over over there that is filled with drives. Yeah, but in two and years' time, those drives won't boot up. The, well, the saying, that I'll never up. that I'll never need again. Like, um, maybe I, you know, so I'll, I'll throw them for the same amount of money per year. Essentially, I can throw them up to Wasabi or AWS Glacier or whatever, whatever the slow permanent storage is. And if I need it, I'll download it. If I don't need it, then maybe after two years, I'll just torch it. You know, I'll even get rid of what's up there. Like, you know, uh, I haven't reached the, the phase with my uh, my freelance clients yet where, like, I there's a contractual, how long are you holding on to this thing? Um, the one I'm working with right now, I think I'm just going to give them an archive when I'm done. And here you go, you know. Make it their problem. <laughs> make it their problem, yeah. It, it is their problem. Yeah. But for the stuff that I've done, you know, direct client or whatever, it's... Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a convert now to just, uh, especially like to, to Wayne's, Wayne's point if, or, or an Alan's point too. If it's a, a show or a movie and it's been released, it's, it's not coming back. So I'll throw it up to cloud storage and leave it there. And after a couple of years, just let it go. So I do similar to what Randy's doing though. I, back it up, I clone my system and then I clone it to a second one and then a cloud one as well. So um, I spend too much time backing up really to justify the, you know, this job will never come back. Why do I care about it? You know, getting it off to two other systems to make sure it's in a safe place. You know, it just drives me insane. Because I've always had the fear put through to me Um you know, keep everything. That's when I used to work in a facility. It was like the, the management there said, we're going to keep everything. And it was just like LTO, offsite backup, everything. We Are didn't they have still cloud in business, back. John? Pardon? Are they still in business? <laughs> no, they, they closed the doors. They uh, No, they not, not closed the doors because they went broke. They closed the doors because the guy got too old and wanted to retire. <laughs> Sell the place and go. But uh, 
I mean, I've still got all their archives and it's on LTO5 and there's probably 400 tapes that, um, you know, over the last, and I've been, they've closed for five years now and over the last five years, I think I was asked for about three or four jobs, you know, sort of kind of not worth it in some respect, just to keep 500 tapes sitting on a shelf. Right. A great way to play dominoes. Yeah. So if anyone wants any uh, pre-loved LTO5 tapes with... uh, Gently gently used. On a cachet system. (laughs) You're more than welcome to have it for free. (laughs) Yeah, just pay pay the shipping, right? Yeah. I just realized I just broadcast this on the internet because um, this is now being recorded. (laughs) Well, I'll like save you from yourself now, John. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming on today. I know at least here in the States, it's a holiday weekend and a lot of people are away or they're with their families and everything. So thank you for tuning in. Um, I do have uh, two things to give away. So we're going to do that real quick. I've got the uh, license of optics from our friends at Boris Effects. da 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 No music this time. Sorry. Adam, oh. congratulations, my friend. Oh, fantastic. And then we're going to do your choice of anything from the Logic merch store, and that is going to... Randy, this could be uh, our opportunity to get rid of one of those fanny packs. Brian Bailey, you know... Because I know when I think fanny pack, I'm going Brian Bailey. Congratulations, brother. Sure. Do you have one I can see? Because that sounds awesome. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll send you an image of it. And you have your choice. You can do that in white or black, which is great because that way you know, <laughs> it, 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 it goes with everything. Um, thank you again, everybody. I'm going to just fill you. Uh, we'll, we'll do the, uh, the uh, slideshow to get out here. Coming up on Logic Live in two weeks, Brian and Bernd are going to compete in the Render Dome. That is on Sunday, July 13th at 2 p.m have to wear your fanny pack ryan you know it and not much else uh on july 24th <laughs> uh stefan labrie is going to be on to continue the summer of flame 2022 uh and then on august 7th we're going to have a, a certified public accountant a guy named david kameny uh who's an accountant to uh many of us or at least a couple of us that i know of in the visual effects industry for like an ask me anything for anybody who's working from home or has their own business or anything like that and is wondering what they can do uh, or what they should be doing from a financial standpoint. We're going to have David on. If you haven't signed up for the forum yet, please do it. Forum.logic.tv. We'll get those stat numbers going up, make Randy happy. And while you're there, sign up for the Discord. This episode of Logic Live, like all of its uh, brethren, will be available on the website and later sistering. today. Yes, it's compadres. Um, <laughs> if you haven't checked out uh, the Logic Podcast interview with Brian Bailey, please do. Uh, you can get it at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher, or anywhere where podcasts are available. I did update this graphic for you, Randy. We're up to uh, 1,421, I believe it's the number of subscribers, to the YouTube channel. We just have to take out some of Joel's family and friends. Uh, as a reminder, again, uh, if you can make it to the uh, Detroit Flame User Group meeting on August 18th, please do. It's going to be a guaranteed good time. Yes, Thank there'll be lots of square of our- pizza there, too. There'll be square pizza with those lovely, like curl, like curled up cup, cups of pepperoni, you know, which is uh, worth the trip. Thank you to our patrons. Be sure to check out the merch store. If anything isn't working, give a shout to Jack Horrocks at jack at flametech.com.au. We want to thank our friends at Boris FX. Uh, if you are in the market for anything from Boris, be sure to use the Logic-15 discount code at checkout. And thank you, AJA for uh, supporting Logic. Let me see. Yes. This was great, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Have a wonderful holiday weekend if you're here in the States. And happy Canada Day to all of our Canadian friends. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Take thank care. You. See ya. Bye. Thanks. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.